all opportunities to ask our panelists questions. The, the, the focal point of the topic is uh, on challenges in going to extreme scale. So I was going to get the ball rolling with uh, one or two questions, but uh, and and by the way, panelists, when uh, when when uh, you're asked a question, I'd like to ask that you could keep your remarks on on individual questions to less than two minutes, and I'll have a little timer up here to help me help me keep us on track. That way, it gives us more opportunity to ask questions. But I'll get the ball rolling with the first one, and that is, um, it's actually a two-part question. Uh, what was your biggest challenge in getting to uh, large scale on current generation systems, and what's your biggest fear about? getting to even larger scales on next generation systems. I'm first, right? Sure, go, you, you've got the mic, so I go ahead, Rob. <laughs> it's hard to say what, my, what the biggest challenge was. Uh, it was a series of incremental things that we had to overcome to get to where we are. Um, on the implementation side, um, in the early days, it was easy to do things like uh, do some order P type calculations in some parts of the code, order P where P is the number of processors, in some parts of the code just out of laziness and it was the easiest thing to code and then eventually that starts to bite you and you, you have to do less and less of that as you go along. I'd say one, the main thing we've worked on uh, to get to where we are today are algorithmic changes, m actually math algorithm changes. Um, things like lexicographical Gauss-Seidel don't work, uh, and they don't parallelize, they're sequential. Um, so you have to do something different that changes the convergence properties of the methods and there are many many instances of things we've had to do even most recently with the ex looking at exascale and uh, where we've had to change the algorithm. Lori mentioned doing uh, not doing Galerican anymore in, in AMG is something we're doing right now so a completely different coarse grid operator that we're constructing algebraically which means uh, you know a lot of the nice convergence properties are, are out the window and we have new things to look at. So that, those are probably the, the main types of things. Um, as far as biggest fear for the future, I actually don't have a fear for the future. I think it's kind of exciting. <laughs> but <laughs> that's because you know it's, it's a challenge. And uh, for me, it's fun to come up with you know, ways to try to deal with these new architectures that are coming out. So. Uh, let's see, well, I, I, I agree with a lot of, a lot of the general things that, that Rob said. Um, I, I also I start at the end. I, I don't have really much of a fear in, in the sense that um, there's a lot of discussion of what we're going to really see, but I haven't really felt a lot of the uh, issues that people are, are saying that we should be um, afraid of. Uh, in terms of, of things we've done to, to, to be able to get the scaling that we want, it's a little bit of a hard question because there's a lot of what scaling means to a lot of different people. Uh, you know, can can vary quite a bit. And if you're talking in a research conference uh, area, you can sort of pick your problems and make, for instance, make your subdomain sizes very large in an artificial way. Whereas your applications just don't, you know, can't put up with that. And uh, you know, they don't, they don't think you need any memory at all. And so they've got tiny, tiny subdomains and so on. Um, and the, the scalability that you're going to be able to get on uh, a real application might not be the kinds of things where you go to a math conference and you've got to have perfect scaling for everything. And so what is really scalable for, it, say, a math conference, a computer science conference where everything looks really perfect and what you really see in real applications is not always uh, particularly um, the same. Uh, but in, in terms of maybe one, I think, general thing that we have is that I, I think that what we've done in, in the, the solvers that we have in PETC or the AMG solvers are, are set up inherently to be fairly scalable, certainly at the, at the, at the, the distributed memory level. Uh, a lot of our challenges and the things that I don't work with personally, Jed does a lot more in PETC or dealing with all the changes that we're seeing on Node. Um, but one of the things that we do have a problem which is an example of what you get in with, with lots of libraries, is to really do a very good scalable uh, algebraic multigrid solver. You really have to think, and, and Rob has, has mentioned this earlier, about how you deal with your coarse grids. And um, one thing that you want to be able to think about doing is... 
Oh, I have two minutes. Oh, two more minutes? No, you have oh, two more minutes. Okay. <laughs> okay. But anyway, we, we, I'll just say briefly is that one of the things that we rely on for good coarse grids uh, solvers is being able to do good mesh partitioners. And Parametus is a great product, but it was, really was not built to be extremely scalable. And that's actually our bottleneck now. And we would, we would, we, we've been talking about trying to get better mesh partitioners, but we just haven't gotten around to doing it or getting somebody that will do it for us. So getting up to today, I would say the math and the scalable implementations within our code, that is interesting stuff and it's our responsibility. And so we better be able to figure it out and generally we can. Uh, a big annoyance is when the system has some non-scalable implementation. The implementation doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And the worst case of that is when it only fails at really large scale. Because now you're trying to debug some problem in system software that you're not really expected to understand, and it only manifests itself at large scale. And that tends to be expensive in terms of a lot of human time figuring out what's going on, a lot of bumbling around. Uh, looking forward, I would say the thing I'm most scared about is misinformation. So uh, there's a lot of, in fact, a lot of people have financial incentive to not give you the straight story. The people that have more information about what is coming up they don't give you a very straight story. <laughs> they all disagree about things, and they have a significant stake in, uh, <laughs> in making their story sound important. Uh, so it, we have to somehow deal with that and direct our effort in some place that's going to end up providing efficiency. Uh, in fact, we don't care about scalability at all. We care about efficiency. So the easiest way to make software scalable is to make it sequentially inefficient. This is a Bill Grop quote from 1999. Uh, so we actually want something that's efficient for the problems at a size that we care about. And transient science, that is transient simulation, fundamentally does not weak scale. The reason is you need more time steps to go for a fixed period of time. And so we have smaller and smaller subdomains as you try to scale that out to higher resolution or whatever the direction of scaling is. Uh, so it, now we have to deal with a more critical latency bottleneck. So, so the, in the area, I have been working with uh, uh, one of the uh, demand, I would say, it's uh, the progress is not very satisfactory, is in the parallel scalable combinatorial algorithms. For example, uh, the, the simple thing is uh, for numerical pivoting, as I mentioned, we could use uh, the, we could uh, uh, state the problem as a maximum uh, bipartite uh, weighted graph uh, algorithm. And then there's no good, uh, right now, the uh, no good uh, parallel scalable algorithm to do that. So that's, a, um, we have seen a lot of papers from combinatorial uh, computing science uh, uh, community, but uh, so we haven't been able to really get it to to be able to use that as a reliable tool in this uh, context. So that's uh, something, you know, it's not uh, traditionally in numerical computing community. And uh, for the future, uh, right now we, we started doing MPI plus OpenMP plus uh, CUDA or maybe OpenCL. So I think uh, this is uh, getting very scary. <laughs> Uh, I would like to see from programming uh, model the community, let's say, um, to see whether they can simplify this uh, one uh, programming paradigm that we can use instead of messing around with uh, all the different, dealing with all different hierarchical architecture with the different specifics uh, of uh, CUDA, OpenCL. And uh, my colleagues, uh, some of them have been trying to use uh, the PGAS uh, global address space. I don't know whether there's any le lecture about that. Yeah, it's been already. Like, for example, UPC is a good example. But uh, in the linear algebra, even for dense matrix, uh, we haven't seen much uh, advantage over pure MPI plus OpenMP. So that's something, I even some of uh, my colleagues also tried to use UPC for sparse Cholesky factorization, for example, and couldn't get uh, the beta MPI code, basically. Okay. 
Uh, with only two minutes, I won't go into what was hard. Um, <laughs> actually, what, what, what was the hardest? What was the hardest? Well, I, well, let me say why it was wasn't as hard as it what it wasn't as hard as it's going to be. I mean, what, we went through the golden era of distributed computing with MPI. You know, I mean, that lasted for a good ten years. You know, and we, so we had we had a model. We had to figure out how to work with that model. We have a whole lot of software and algorithms based on that model. My big fear in going forward is twofold that we cannot maintain that model at all and have to do something all over again. And the types of things we do are very, a lot of irregular calculations with a lot of logic in there, a lot of decision processes, if you will. And rewriting that to be something that works in a, you know, in a pipeline and on arrays on is not something I'd like to have to think about. So that would be a big fear I would have. But that's not my biggest fear. My biggest fear is the unknown of what the new systems are going to be. Um, you know, over a year ago, I went through a non-disclosure with one of the computer manufacturers, and they described the system they were expecting to come out with, and it sounded just wonderful, at least from our perspective. Well, since then, that's totally changed, and what they're what they, it sounds like they're going to do it, it doesn't sound so wonderful anymore. Uh, but irrespective, what the hell is it that these systems are going to look like? I, that I'd like to know so that we can start thinking about, do we have any chance of providing a set of tools that are going to work on them in, in an effective manner? Okay. Hang on to my So I, very wide-ranging uh, variations on opinions there, which is, uh, which is interesting. So I, I have more questions I could certainly ask, but we're here for, for uh, uh, the folks here, students, to ask questions. So. Does anybody have a follow-up question or related topic on issues related to scaling? Um, yeah, by, by going to bigger and bigger scales, uh, we usually think about going to higher and higher resolution. However, higher resolution also means more time steps to solve. And usually, we don't want to increase the computation time arbitrarily. So uh, is anybody working on uh, something to parallelize in time? You want to talk? I can, yeah. Okay. Are you doing that too? Uh, yeah, we just, uh, we just started working on that, um, uh, I don't know, six, eight, seven, eight months ago, maybe a little longer. Um, and that's one of the most interesting things to me about the future. So um, it can be a scary thing too, but because it completely changes the way we do time integration the way we've always done it. Um, and you're replacing something that's a perfectly good optimal algorithm with uh, an iterative one that has to converge. And um, yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting from my perspective, but uh, it's something that's important in the future. And I think uh, we'll see where that goes. At a high level, can you describe how to? Well, we're doing multi-grid in time. OK, multi-grid. Yeah. And things you like said two minutes. Well, he's things got a like left. yeah, things like parareal, uh, for example, can be viewed, which is a popular method that you may have heard about, um, is a two grid method, um, but you can do this multi level as well. Um, and there's there's the research actually starts something like 50 years ago in this topic area, but it's very very sparse amount of work that's been done to date, but it's starting to catch on a lot right now. You see a lot more of it at, at meetings and things like that. People are working on it again. So people are really excited about parallel and time integrators, but it, almost every paper you'll see is taking advantage of other structure that could be exploited by choosing a better sequential time integrator. So for example, you'll see a lot of people working on parabolic problems. And they'll solve a parabolic problem to really high accuracy with a low order time integrator with short time steps. Well, that's crazy because we should use a high order integrator with large time steps that would get there much faster. So w when you choose this terrible method for solving the problem, then you find out you can take advantage of a lot of the structure that would have been exploited had you used a, a method that made sense for that problem and show these fantastic results. And it, in parallel time integrators, we're still kind of at this stage where almost all of the papers are showing those sort of 
imaginary results. They're not comparing on the usual basis of comparing integrators, like a work precision diagram. They're not doing a fair comparison against actually good methods that are out there. And you know, basically, they're trying to create some buzz around this idea. And the real question is, is there structure that we can't exploit using these other methods? Like, if I have a dynamical system that gives me some oscillatory structure in time, and can I get some parallelism there when I'm time stepping at the stability limit, not at this accuracy limit? Because chances are I don't need 10 digits of accuracy. I need you know, something less, uh, usually a lot less. So we should compare integrators at a fair accuracy levels. We should do work precision diagrams and use the best available methods as our comparison. And parallel in time looks a lot less exciting with what people have shown so far. I, I think it's important to work on, but take those results with a really big grain of salt. Not all of those results. He's talking about some results. <laughs> <laughs> so do we I know have which ones he's talking about. And, and actually, let me make one more comment about this. Um, so it, one, one big difference about this parallel time stuff is you're, you're switching the algorithm. You, you have this time marching algorithm. And take the best one, the one that works best in serial. That's what we try to do is be discretization agnostic in the space-time discretization. Um, in order to do it in parallel, to get parallelism, you have to change the algorithm. Okay, And that means, in pretty much all cases, you have to do more work. And that means that to do your parallel algorithm in the same amount of time as you could do your sequential one, you need some multiple of processors more. So just to break even, you have to use a whole bunch of processors that you didn't have to use before. And then you can start seeing your speed ups. So it's different from sort of spatial uh, algorithms in that sense. We have another panelist that wants to comment on this topic. Oh, I don't know. I, I don't think I want Chad to get me. <laughs> <laughs> I know who Chad is. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, what about uh, coupled space time? What about coupled space time? That's the same question. Well, yeah, but then you have to actually discretize in the coupled space time. So you don't necessarily need to move one step at a time. Yeah, so it, it, this is expected. So w when we talk about parallel in time, usually we've already decomposed in space. And in fact, usually we've decomposed out to the strong scaling limit in space. And so we can't reduce our turnaround time anymore by adding more spatial decomposition. So now we start adding the time decomposition. And you, we say, can we do better? Are you referring more explicitly to the use of uh, space-time space time functions? Yeah, yeah, like actually to do space-time coupled in right. the scheme, in how you actually how the scheme works. Yeah, right. Like, right. So, like so, so, so for example, you end up still doing it in slabs. Yeah, it's not okay. Right. So, if you do a slab that's global across your whole domain, you do a, a this time slab, and you use the same say number of space-time elements in the time direction. And it, so space-time DG is popular to do this. Yeah. Um, so it, if you do that and you're not using adaptivity um, so that some parts of the domain have many small steps, okay? So do that, discretize everything, you choose a quadrature, you choose your basis functions for your DG, and you come out with an implicit Runge-Kutta scheme. So it, that's something that we've known about for ages, and they're actually really good methods. But it, the fully discrete method you get out is the same. Now, space-time DG is interesting when you have, say, smaller time steps in some parts of the domain. Basically, you're doing a local uh, time stepping of some sort on a possibly stiff system and solve the whole coupled space-time system. And it, I think that's very interesting. It's not giving you a huge amount of parallelism in time, but it's actually a very sensible discretization. It can be quite good. Did you have a comment, Mark? Uh, All right. Uh, another another question. Yes. Are there any particular problems that you guys have been looking at, but feel as if they've been um, limited by not having exascale? Or is there something that you anticipate being capable of doing now that exascale is on the playing field? So new new science that you think you will be able to do, but haven't so far because of exascale. 
Anyone? Well, I, I can comment then. Uh, so there, there's a lot of applications that don't quantify uncertainty. And th that's an expensive thing. Uh, you, it's really important to choose the right algorithms. But even if you choose the right algorithms, especially dealing with non-Gaussian distributions or high variance systems, uh, you end up having to do really a lot of work, like thousands of times more than what we do right now. Uh, I think in most cases for single instance systems, the modeling, so, so the mathematical modeling I is such that either we can more or less do the problem with today's technology, or it's not clear that another 1,000x does us a whole lot of good. So uh, there's exceptions to that. So just to be clear, when you talk about the UQ context there, you mean running many, many problems simultaneously on a much, much larger compute resource, or one massive problem? Uh, both. OK. So right. th there's, um, there's stochastic Galerkin methods. Which, which, so that's one formulation. It's an intrusive UQ, they call it sometimes. Uh, so it, it, with those methods, you solve coupled problems that are much larger. And there's sort of, uh, they, there's like mixing of the different instances you, that you're working on. And then there's stochastic collocation or Monte Carlo methods that may sample independently, basically. And then you just have a large ensemble that's not being mixed together or not being mixed together at any frequency. That was the I thought I had. Go ahead, Mark. Uh, I would just comment that the, the DOE, primarily the Office of Science, had done a whole series of reports for each of the application areas that are available online that discuss their their exascale needs. Obviously, UQ is, is very high on that list, but they also have single applications where they, they can't do that into, without much more than, you know, they need much more than they have today, and they, they, they documented some of those specific problems. OK, another question? Yes, go ahead. When will we see that hybrid programming model emerging in some of the famous open source libraries. Uh, OK, so oh, MPI plus, when will it be sort of Sorry. coming out? Go. Uh, it's already in hyper, so. Um, but <laughs> just MPI plus OpenMP. We haven't done uh, much with GPUs yet. Um, well, 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 Jed will tell you about, about uh, PET-C um, or, or general PET-C issues. But and they're, uh, I mean, for what I work, work, worry about in, in algebraic multigrid is that it's just very tedious to do um, the setup costs very effectively, in, um, which are sort of the bottleneck if you can really get all the compute stuff really uh, highly parallelized and done well. And you've got to deal with the setup costs still. And those are very tedious to do in, in, a, in a new programming language in general, whether it's you know, CUDA or threads. So there is some support in Petsy for using threads. One of our concerns is that different users use different threading models. So some use TBB, and some use P threads that they roll themselves, and they want to call Petsy from individual P threads on separate smaller problems. And others want to solve really large problems and have Petsy use threads internally. So it, those are somewhat different approaches, and we're trying to uh, create something that sort of unifies those so we're not maintaining many different implementations for these different scenarios. Uh, unfortunately, the threading programming models don't tend to make much effort to be library friendly. So we might get called, it makes sense for us to get called, from some group of threads, like there's eight threads, the user wants us to use some of those. But in fact, the process has a lot more threads, and some of them are doing something else. Uh, so how do we know when one part of the application is calling from OpenMP and one part is from pthreads? There's a lot of system level issues there that uh, the programming models don't really play well with. Uh, some particular stacks do a, do a better job of that. Sherry, you want to comment on GPU and uh, work in SuperLU at all on this point? Well, not not too much. I think uh, the um, as I, I said, if I would like to see something like a UPC, which is more uniform, you know, not mixing a lot of stuff. If this kind of tool can be used uh, 
for the software developers, that will be uh, useful. But so right now, the what is, what is UPC? I'm sorry, I uh, mentioned that Universal before. Parallel C. Okay. That's what it is. But it, it's a global address uh, space. So you write your program more like uh, you want to transfer data. You say you get something from somewhere, and then you put put your data to some other place, and the, the each data has an uh, address which uh, knows which process it's on. So, so, but this, uh, uh, this will, I mean, conceptually, this will simplify a lot of uh, programming has hassle there you know, the, for the developers. But so far, we haven't seen the speed advantage compared to what we do at the low level MPI plus various things. I don't think it's even close at this point. <laughs> Well, okay. th there are some uh, demonstrations, uh, but uh, it's. Uh, uh, I think uh, the the two communities are s quite separate, and then the fund there's no funding model to to support uh, the the work of both. Not like a side act of funding both uh, libraries and application partnership, but uh, the funding mo model seems for programming language is entirely computer science, and funding model for the mathematical software or application is entirely separate office. So I'm, that. Jeff, you'd like to? Well, I'm, I'm Would, uh, I just wanted to comment, there's a lot of misinformation out there about threading um, and about what's important with threading. So it, you can have, say, a team at Intel that spends a lot of effort optimizing a PDE code that we're familiar with for threads. And at the end of the day, the flat MPI version runs faster. And there's a lot of other cases of people put a lot of effort into threads. They conclude that somehow those threads are better. And in fact, there's slightly different ways of using plain MPI that perform better. So th this misinformation and there's a lot of selection bias. So it's a publishable result to say X will not work at scale Y. And usually not the other way around of, well, it seems to be working just fine for us or you know, we made some minor change in the way that we're using X, and it continues to work just fine. I see Paul has got his hand up. So go, go ahead, Paul. Yeah, so I, I was wondering, yesterday morning, Tim Warburton gave a, a talk, and one of the things he mentioned is OCCA, OCCA, which he's trying to implement a unified threading model. Uh, have you looked at that? Uh, I know it's not quite there yet, but does that seem like something that would help with the issues, especially Jed, that you were talking about? Of different threading models. It, conceivably, uh, I haven't looked at it in detail. I've I've seen okay. some summary, but it, it tends to take a fair amount of effort to sort out what are the limitations and you know whether something's ready to go. So, isn't uh, Barry is uh, looking into some uh, threading model for to be used uh, for Pet C or now by by threading model? Do you mean uh, thread safe uh, <coughs> calling from an app or th use of threads internally in Pet C? It, so, so we're working on a thing we we call the thread communicator. So it's basically a unifying way of coordinating threads and running on top of different threading models like OpenMP or pthreads or TBB. Uh, so. The reason we do this, though, is not necessarily that this is the best possible way to solve things. In fact, I think in many cases, threads are not the best possible way to do it. But Petsy has lots of different applications. And those applications make their decisions about whether to use threads or not, or how to use the threads, what granularity to use them, based on lots of external factors. So if Petsy is going to be useful and flexible enough that those applications can use it, um, that it will perform well when they use it from, you know, based on whatever other decisions they make, then we should be able to operate in many of these different environments. And so in order to deal with that, we are definitely putting effort into threading. And similarly, there's applications that are using GPUs, and so we have support for that kind of stuff. Although in many cases, when we really choose the best CPU algorithm and the best GPU algorithm, we're not seeing benefits, or not seeing benefits at the problem scale that people care about. So just to be, just to make sure I understand, though, when you say you're putting effort into threading, that means you're making it possible for threads to call Petsy, and or you're making use of threads internally in Petsy, or both. Both. Okay. All right. 
in, go, go ahead. Yeah, so I was curious in terms of uh, PDE algorithms, whether you guys see any particular sort of uh, technique or technology, whatever you want to call it, or method that uh, is going to be a game changing for Exascale. High order, matrix free when possible, um, all within the scope of what is available for you. Um, so there's lots of. Uh, it, so one of the really central challenges that comes up is non-smoothness. So it, that can be rough coefficients or it can be nonlinearity in various forms that it ends up being non-smooth. If things are smooth, we have fairly classical technology that tends to do pretty well. And uh, often we will balance the arithmetic intensity. So basically balance the amount of work so that memory bandwidth and flops are both exercised on that machine. And so if the problem is smooth enough, you sort of tune that so you're using the machine efficiently and solving your problem as fast as possible. The latter part is the important part, but using the machine efficiently often you know, comes along with that. Uh, when things get non-smooth, then you have these externalities and often very different amounts of computational effort. I agree with, with much of what Jed said, and and I, I guess I'm I, I hate to be the person that is always like I don't think there's going to be a problem, um, <laughs> but uh, I, and so I'll I'll say that I don't think there's any real game changers in PD. I think all the basic things that we we do are 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 going to work. Techniques, yes, I can see that there can be techniques that'll make. You know, I don't really see big algorithmic changes. You know, th for instance, in the solver world, you know, FMM is a nice method. Multigrid is a nice method, and they're good for di they're good for different domains. And there's a certain dividing point of where things change. I don't see that dividing line really changing radically with 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 scale. Um, but within those domains, uh, and certainly not at the level of equations, which people talk about too, like maybe we should, you know. Uh, you know, we're going to get have to change our equations around because of exascale. But I think certainly techniques in, in lower level um, things I don't really like to call algorithms, but things that, that cha don't change the semantics of the of the of the methods uh, significantly at least. Um, those those techniques are certainly going to change a lot, and they always they always um, have. And and I just one m mention on higher order. Higher order is very very good. And it's you know it's it's good, but it's it's uh, it's not a new thing. And people have always wanted to use high order, and it's hard to use high order effectively. You know, Jed mentioned one aspect of it that you know you have to have enough smoothness to b exploit high order. Um, and so, but it's good being you know we're in, in business for being able to do hard things. So, um, but it, it's it's you know, there's nothing really new about being able to exploit high order. But that's definitely something that's that's a, a good thing to do. I mean, an aspect of higher order that has to be remembered on complex domains is that also influences your mesh generation process. You know, if you if you have a higher order uh, p uh, discretization method, you have to have an equally high order approximation to your geometry at the mesh level, and there is very little out there in uh, higher order mesh generation technologies, uh, so th that needs to be coupled with it. Uh, a comment on on the uh, discretization methods is, you know, there's a number of methods that allow you to deal with discontinuities, et cetera, that I, I, I bother me from the standpoint of they, they tend to be numerically ill-conditioned in themselves. So uh, at least our group tends to like to work with stabilized finite element methods, for example, because they tend to produce betterly conditioned numerical systems. Now that doesn't uh, deal with what, what what Jed was saying with respect to when you have just larger, co you know, large variations of coefficients because you have very large stiffness variations in, in the types of parameters you have. But <laughs> discretization methods that artificially introduce more uh, dis uh, numerical conditioning problems, I think uh, we want to be avoiding. So I just want to understand, Mark, you said if, if you're do dealing with higher order methods and representation of some field over some geometry, you're right. saying that you also have to make sure you discretize the geometry at that, that oh, order yeah. as yes, well? Oh, yes, yes, okay. yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I would, I would if you want to you are at the design order of the method. Correct. Exactly. So that's why I think, I think it's not, I mean, it's not, you are right. If you want to show a nice convergence plot of that order, you are perfectly right. But I think to actually 
see benefits, you can also have a lower order well, if, No, no, if I want to if I want to solve the problem you asked me to solve, right? If if the thing is is a sphere and I'm approximating that with a t with 12 order elements, I'm not going to have a lot of elements over that. And if I make my geometric approximation quadratic with C0 approximations to the to the geometry, those kinks between elements are going to introduce concentrations, and I'm going to have an artificial solution. So I'm not be, I'm not solving the, the I'm solving the PDE on a totally different domain. That's right. So I have you know, so it's not you know but yes on the convergence plot you know if you want the convergence say but if I'm you know but that's the convergence for the problem you said you wanted to solve. So you know, if you want me to solve a different problem, yeah, then I'm solving that on that geometry, not on the geometry you you really gave me. And and depending on the problem, that can be important. Now, if the problem doesn't care about local curvature information or anything else, then fine. Yes, if I screw up my geometric approximation, then my convergence in parameters of interest that are more integral based aren't going to matter. But if I'm doing something where you know the Getting the curvature well approximated is important, et cetera. Well, or very local variables that may need to, you know, have crack propagation or something. Then that's a different story. Okay. Uh, another question? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I was just wondering of your input. Let's say, you know, a normal scenario where your supervisor just gets sends you the table with a new application with an LES solver or whatever. At the moment, it scales to 64 processors. You need to you need higher fidelity. What would your roadmap be to actually achieve this extreme scalability? I mean, would you first go and optimize serially for efficiency? Because otherwise, as people mentioned, you can have really really scalable codes but really inefficient. And then worry about parallel algorithms. Because we also saw that you have communication aware parallel algorithms. I mean, what would the roadmap be? How where would you start from that point where you receive the application? What would you go about it? <laughs> so the, the, the most common problem is that people don't do I.O. properly. So they read lots of ASCII files or something like this, and it's non-scalable. And all the commercial engineering codes have this problem. And it actually doesn't even, for many of them, they're, say, solving solid mechanics problems. It doesn't even matter what the performance of the solver is, because they if they try to scale it up, they spend all their time dealing with this horrible input format uh, <laughs> and totally non-scalable I.O. So th there are things like that. I would say uh, look at the, so I would say profile the code to look for bottlenecks and prefer to focus first on things that are fundamental serial inefficiencies because you can misdiagnose other problems if you have critical serial inefficiencies. And then pick off one at a time. You, you, you do your profiling. And in fact, it, it can be really useful to sample. Uh, so you basically do your scaling study across whatever range makes sense for your problem. And you've profiled into separate events. So you look at how each of those <coughs> sort of components of your code are scaling. And pick the ones that are scaling worst. Um, so that's a good start. Um, yeah, I guess I interpreted your question a little bit differently. I, I agree with everything that Jed said, as, as, as usual. Um, but uh, I, 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 <laughs> um, I got the so I, I think that if, if you're if you're looking at how to how to go about planning on 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 developing a code and scaling it up and so on, you know, you're measuring and things. But I think that you, you sort of asked whether you should look at serial or the parallel implementations and so on. One, I think you can do those to some degree in parallel, but you definitely need to look at both for the obvious reasons that you can have a crappy serial implementation and it's not going to do you any good. I think in the parallel front that there's one benefit that lets you uh, be able to do things in in parallel, so to speak, is that we're pretty stable that we're going to be having M distributed memory address spaces, uh, albeit uh, um, you know, modulo uh, what what Sherry wants um, in, in a PGAS, uh, you know, widely widely used PGAS languages. Um, we're going to have a distributed memory uh, space, and that's going to be MPI um, on on the global scale. And that is something that you need to think about. You know, and the good thing about that is that, that we sort of know what that is. But the bad thing is it's hard to do. You have to, and you have to explicitly think about how to 
decompose your problem in a sensible way in your, your application and, and so on. But once you do that, that's something that, that you can, there's a lot of experience in doing it and that's going to be useful for your, your, you know, your product, whatever it happens to be for, you know, I have to imagine at least another 20 years and that that's something you can spend effort doing and, and, uh, and do well. I've got a very pragmatic uh, comment for you. Uh, I'd also make sure you looked around the literature and, who, and find somebody that's been working on a similar problem that has been doing it for a while at, you know, at scale and, not, and see the methods they use and techniques they use, because that's a good starting point for you to compare and say, okay, what things are, are you know, does this code use? Because if, if you've got something that's only scaling to 64 cores, you may not even be using MPI yet. Who knows? I, you know, uh, where you, 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 as Mark said, you know, you, at least in today's environment, you want performance and to large scale, you're going to use MPI. So just start, you know, start off by the obvious looking at what some others have done in that area. So a, a follow-up to that, though, real quick. Let's suppose he's on, on the you know, scalability trajectory, and he's at 32,000 cores, but he's on his way to half a million now, and there's problems. Do you, do you still propose profiling it? Do we have tools that will profile at 32,000, and are they useful? Have you used, used these kind before? Anybody? I think you're going to see some. If you look carefully at the profiling, it, you'll see what issues are hurting you past the 64,000 or whatever number you're at, irrespective of, you know, you see that at a much lower number if you look carefully. So you mean, you're basically saying the profile data from low core counts gives you enough to, to get over whatever it, hurdles you've if, got? If you look very carefully. Okay. Well, so uh, profiling doesn't need to be full tracing. So there's a scalability problem for tracing. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, profiling, you can just set a number of events within your code. And it, so we do this in Petsy, for example. You run with dash log summary, and you'll get a summary of all of these components within the solver and how expensive they were. So it, that's very compressed data, and it isn't necessarily enough to suss everything out. But you can certainly find where the major issues that you need to look closer are. And it, that's completely scalable. Okay. Yeah, and, and also a lot of times parallelism can be your friend. You can have, you know, the full tracing way can, can look if you only have a small set of processors, but a simpler, uh, you know, uh, events and so on that's fairly uh, of tracing that if you, if you have something and you're not quite, ch you're not seeing a lot of data, if you really sk use a lot of processors, then, you know, bugs that you have start becoming a lot more obvious and simple, fairly simple tracing to uh, performance uh, uh, instrumentation can give you a lot more information or show you where your bottlenecks are when you really start scaling up beyond where you're even interested in doing right now. But if you're just trying to see where the bottlenecks are and then implement, trying to optimize getting some of the really, uh, uh, getting rid of some of the big bottlenecks at the really large scale, will be getting rid of the bottlenecks that are harder to see at the more scale that you're really working at currently. I think there was a question at the back, and then I'll come to you. Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, sure, yes. Yeah, sure. uh, I just have oh, a quick oh, comment. Sorry, so, so now there are uh, good performance profiling tools you can use. For example, like a tau. Um, you can get a first order approximation where the code is spend a lot of time on different uh, portion without uh, you know you're manually going to instrument the code yourself. Okay. Question at the back. Uh, we heard some new features in MPIG. So are there any ones in particular you are interested in using your code? New, new features in MPI 3. Any, any particular ones stand out as far as addressing scalability? Is that your question? Yes. Okay. W what are the new features you have in mind? One-sided communication. One-sided communication? Uh, well, so I, I'll comment first on uh, non-blocking collectives. So it, there's like I all reduce and I barrier. Uh, so non-blocking barrier might sound funny, but it, there's actually a really useful protocol where you can do uh, messages that are not expected um, using a synchronization based on iBarrier. It turns out to be communication optimal. That was a paper a few years back. Um, so it also, the I all reduce is very useful for a number of places. Uh, pipeline Krelov methods is an obvious one. Also, a lot of checks that you can have in time stepping. Um, so th that deals with a fundamental synchronization issue 
The problem is the MPI implementations out there right now are so bad. So on the one hand, we have machines like BlueGene that are extremely low latency, and the blocking reduction just doesn't hurt you very much. And on the other hand, we have machines where reductions are really expensive, and they implemented the function I all reduce. But in fact, you call I all reduce, and then you go do other stuff for several times the amount of time it takes for a normal reduction, and including neighbor communication and whatever else you're doing. And you finally get around an MPI wait on that request from the I all reduce, and it takes as long as doing a synchronous all reduce at that point. So you gain nothing by exposing this uh, asynchrony. So the implementations have to make progress. Like we talk to the vendors about this, and they say, well, the hardware can definitely do it much better. Non-blocking reductions are a good idea. And we say, well, how come your hardware isn't doing it? They say, well, it's probably a software problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody is assigned to that problem right now. So it needs to go in the procurements for new machines to motivate these people to do that implementation better. Uh, as far as one-sided, there's uh, MPI win allocate shared. So there's an int interesting paper, MPI plus MPI. Yeah. It, you know, it basically, a, a way of using MPI within a node in a sort of hierarchical way where you can have uh, shared memory regions. And it, that's actually really attractive as compared to threads. So, so threads are shared everything by default, and then you have to do some work to not share. Um, not to have overlapping rights and the kind of things that hurt performance for threads. Um, MPI plus MPI is separate everything by default, and you can share the things that you want to share and nothing else. So, uh, I was going to go to the. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Okay. So, while using higher order methods, for example, in finite differences, uh, an eighth order scheme in three dimensions will have 25 points of stencil. So, uh, when you want to scale this, it becomes very much a uh, single core performance actually drops a lot when you use higher order stencils. That too, when you have like 20 species in a combustion problem. So how do you do, deal with such systems? Do you use cache blocking or what do you suggest for better single core performance? So you can consider other discretizations than the really high order finite difference. So there's more compact discretizations. Um, you can all, so both by moving to uh, high order element type discretizations like DG um, or spectral element. So it, then you have this sort of it, more regular local operations. Um, you can also go to compact schemes, which then have tridiagonal or banded solves. And Debo over there is the expert on performance of compact and nonlinear compact schemes. Um, so it influences those choices, but why did you have such high order to begin with? This is probably because you were really benefiting from the high order. Uh, that is, the solution is smooth enough. So we typically use for turbulent flow simulations, and we want to have very small time steps, so it's better to do explicit discretization in time, where you don't end up with AX equal to V type of solver. Yeah, so the, the solvers you end up with in compact schemes are banded. Um, so th they're actually solves you can do efficiently. So it, it well, he, he can show you the preprint on, on that. So do we need the other panelists want to comment on this topic? Okay. Go ahead. Um, just curious, are you guys eager to make a forecast what uh, the first simulation is going to be run at the scale? Forecast. <laughs> <laughs> Well, say that again, Sherry. QCB? QCD. QCD. Quantum chromodynamics. Uh, uh, actually, I don't know. I, I <laughs> well, I, we know they ever use every minute of computer. I, 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 went to a, I went to a seminar. Uh, they, were, they got a huge problems, and it's uh, not like a very limited in terms of uh, dependency, et cetera. So, so they say they can use uh, however many machines you, you can provide. And they said the uh, simulation probably takes, uh, currently with the biggest machine, it takes uh, years. So say that again, it's quantum chromodynamics, is that what? That's right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Classic SIDAC app that we dealt with a lot in SIDAC 2, 
and they have oh, it's still typically it's still high dimensions, like five dimensions on regular lattices, and like 12 complex multiplies to do with unitary matrices, so everything's well conditioned. You can just throw everything on a GPU, it's so thread regular, and yeah, you, can, you can really wrap up the flow. Yeah, this is a particular seminar I went to, they, they are using GPU effectively. So I'm, I'm beginning to see that the, the, the reason you answer that is it might be the easiest application to get running at exascale. <laughs> well, there's a demand. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so some people will say HPL, because uh, that will probably run, but it will probably take so long to run that the machine will not finish, because uh, it, it doesn't scale properly. Uh, Coupled cluster would be another example that's basically tensor contraction. It boils down to DGEM um, at quite large sizes, and thus it, it's easy to get running at scale. Other, uh, I have a question if, if no one else does, but I'm perfectly happy to let anyone else ask. Okay, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so Sherry, you mentioned that in, uh, in your program, the user needs to specify sort of the dimensions of the process grid breakdown. And uh, we actually do this in our code too. And I, I like to say that this is an important variable for tuning the performance of the code. The users like to say, what does this variable, this magic variable mean? And they come to me and they say, you know, how should I pick it? And it's really just a pain for the user. Um, and I, the only, when I hear that, I like to think about adding auto-tuning capabilities to our code. But our code is pretty close to the user, whereas we're calling libraries here and there. And I don't really know if we, we really should be in charge of auto-tuning so much as calling a stack back <coughs> to libraries like you guys develop to make sure your libraries are tuned for the kind of problems we're setting. So I'm wondering if you all are looking into adding auto-tuning features to your library. Yes, I put that uh, question mark in my uh, slide. So we have been thinking about this uh, for, you know, it, it's uh, something, uh, the problem around, but uh, we haven't uh, really got uh, to do it. Um, there's uh, some uh, work about uh, doing this uh, for sparse matrix vector multiplication, sparse triangular solve in this, uh, oh, this Berkeley library, I forgot. Rich Wodak was uh, doing the OSCE. OSCE. Have you heard about that? Yeah, so so that's a I think that's a good framework to to look look at it. So what they do is uh, for sparse matrix vector mod modification, for example, they do a lot of uh, cache blocking, register blocking, etc. But then they uh, run the the block size uh, will depend on the number of registers, etc. Right. So they they basically run a lot of uh, benchmarks uh, and then run the machine to do the. This is a pre-installation stage. Do a lot of uh, samples, and then run some algorithm, maybe some uh, optimization algorithm, to find the best for the machine. Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, Atlas also uh, is able to do things like that. But I'm kind of wondering, if, I, if I'm calling your, uh, your library, and I have other things going on in the background, perhaps, uh, you know, MPI communication going on while you're trying to do some local solves, uh, if the auto-tuning results are really all that useful, it seems like instead you might need a uh, runtime sort of auto tuning feature. So, are you familiar with FFTW? So, I think it does a fairly good job of auto tuning. Um, so, it has a way of caching wisdom, and basically, it's um, it's creating this empirical performance model that it can then optimize to choose certain distributions. So the best is to have an analytic performance model that just works. Then you analytically just choose something and it's close to the best that you could get from auto-tuning. And then nobody has to think about it. You don't have to spend time on that tuning or deal with machine variability or any of those issues. Yeah, I, and uh, the second somebody, best. I'm sorry, what, go ahead. Well, the second best is basically what FFTW does where you have some cacheable wisdom. So you're building some kind of empirical performance model and then you choose the right thing. Um, the exhaustive auto-tuning gets really expensive and is cumbersome for the workflow. Um, and almost exclusively, the people that really work on auto-tuning don't implement the whole feature set. And in fact, the part they may be auto-tuning often in the actual application is only part, sometimes not even a dominant part of the cost. So 
it doesn't really matter what auto tuning they did. You can't really use the results. And you know they. So in the case of OSCII, you compile all this stuff, and the size of the object, like the binary for all of these optimized variations, is enormous. It's like dozens or a hundred times bigger than all of Petsy, and yet what it does is less than one percent of what Petsy does. So it, does it actually make sense for us to include that? Do you want a gigabyte executable that you you know add to get an optimized kernel of what's twenty percent of your runtime? Well, maybe not. So it, they. People experiment with that, but it tends not to make it in production very often, um, and it tends to be kind of cumbersome. So we have time for Arlie for one more panelist to comment on this topic before I think we need to break for dinner. Anyone else want to comment on it? Okay, well then why don't we thank our panelists. Thank